Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first, uh, good afternoon and a good morning to all of you. I think we have come to the third day and the final session of our webinar. And today, the title of the topic for this afternoon will be Integration of Rubber in a Broad Climate Change and Sustainability Policies, Including Economic and Social Dimensions. So we have five presenters. After that, we will be having the panel discussion, which we would like to invite everybody to participate, especially many of the speakers here. They are not from the rubber sector. So we would welcome feedback from people from the rubber sector, especially the rubber research institutes and even the industry. So it's my pleasure now to, uh, for each speaker, you are given 10 minutes. So first, I would like to invite Mr. Salvatore Pinizotto, the IRSG Secretary General, to make a presentation entitled Natural Rubber, a Strategic Material for a Sustainable World. Please, Mr. Salvatore, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Aziz. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I will try to share my screen now and my presentation. Okay, so my presentation today will be slightly different from what uh, you are, uh, have heard so far in these two days, because my goal is uh, uh, to give, especially to uh, the non-rubber people, uh, a sense of what um, is the situation in the natural rubber economy, uh, what are the supply and demand constraints, uh, and uh, you know, some ideas in terms of uh, what uh, the sector overall is doing in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, so natural rubber is uh, um, very much uh, concentrated uh, sector from a production point of view. Um, represents about 48% of the total uh, rubber production and 52% uh, is, um, is, is given by synthetic rubber. Um, but uh, as you can see from this graph, um, Thailand and Indonesia represent 62% of global natural rubber production. So it's very much concentrated in terms of production. If we include uh, uh, China and uh, Vietnam, we uh, arrive at more than 70% of the production in the world. Uh, from a demand uh, point of view, the situation is uh, similar because uh, on the demand side, uh, China is the biggest by far uh, consumer of natural rubber in the world. And as you can see, uh, a lot of this material uh, is going to produce uh, tires and uh, uh, the rest is going to produce uh, good rubber, um, rubber goods. Uh, and uh, among, uh, among them, we have uh, gloves, uh, condoms uh, as the main, uh, the main uh, end use sector. Uh, not all our production is uh, concentrated in the equatorial uh, zones, um, and uh, no, Southeast Asia represents 91% of the total production. But you know, we have uh, increasing production in uh, Africa, and uh, also some substantial production in uh, South America, mainly Brazil, Guatemala, and uh, other countries in Colombia that are um, still producing natural rubber. Um, overall, uh, we estimate that there are uh, 30 million hectares of uh, land uh, covered by rubber protection. 90% uh, of the production is coming from uh, uh, small holders. Uh, and uh, natural rubber is listed in Europe as a critical raw material. Um, this graph is uh, very well known among uh, rubber experts because it shows the trend of uh, natural rubber and synthetic rubber price uh, since 2010 when we have, we have had uh, you know, the, this peak in production there. But after that, uh, price of natural rubber and synthetic rubber basically uh, went downwards uh, till um, we are 
basically today. Um, so the situation in the NATO Arab sector was already in a, a not easy uh, situation before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that, uh, of course, um, has uh, made the situation even worse uh, from an economic point of view. Uh, this graph shows you the natural rubber uh, production in the world. Um, as you can see, it's very cycle. Uh, it, has, it has reached the 7.5% increase in 2017, but uh, already in 2018, the increase was 2.4%. And in 2019, we had a decline of 1.3%. Uh, if we look at the relationship between supply and demand um, in 2020 and moving forward in 2020, now we are going to see a 4% decline in the natural level production and the 7.4% 7, 7 decline in, the, in, in consumption. Uh, this decline in consumption is mainly driven by the fact that China has uh, you know, uh, slowed down uh, quite a bit. Uh, and the automotive sector also during this pandemic uh, has been uh, greatly affected. Uh, what has happened in terms of um, rubber area increase? Uh, we have seen a 25% increase in total rubber area driven by non-traditional areas uh, recently. Uh, area expansion uh, was under more than 3 million hectares in the last decade. Uh, and in the last three, four years, we have, uh, we are, we have seen a lower total planting uh, due to the fact that uh, the level of price was very low, so there was no incentive to, uh, to plant actually rubber. Uh, if we see the air expansion in some main countries like, uh, like, uh, like Thailand, you, know, you can see uh, you know, we had a lot of new planting in the period of 2004, 2013. Uh, but uh, since then, it's going clearly down. The air expansion was driven by north, northeast, and some part of Thailand. And uh, it was under more than 1 million hectares in the last uh, in the last decade now, if we see the air expansion in indonesia is slightly different uh, we had a big jump in 2004 2009 and since then basically it has been to a lower uh, a lower trend and this is the replanting trend as well If we look at the distribution of rubber area in Thailand and Indonesia, Thailand 60% is in the south. Uh, we had 24%. Uh, we have 24% of rubber plantation in the northeast, 5% in the north, uh, and the rest 5% uh, uh, in the north. In Indonesia, uh, we have 71% of rubber plantation uh, concentrated in Sumatera and uh, uh, Kalimantan we have uh, 25% and the rest uh, 5%. Uh, traditional areas have faced a lot of challenges. We have heard a lot about the incidence of uh, the diseases uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, Thailand as well. Uh, so I'm I will not say much about this. It has had a big impact, especially in Indonesia, uh, with 382,000 of hectares actually affected by uh, this pestalotiopsis disease. And uh, we have seen already these image, images before. Uh, production intensity uh, has changed quite a bit. It went uh, down uh, since 2015. Uh, and the main factor for this uh, trend in terms of production intensity are poor agro management system, increasing share of untapped areas, and the shift from farming to other economic activities. Uh, one of the uh, main topics in the natural sector is sustainability. 
uh, sustainable material supply is a key factor for end users, leading to increased uh, sustainability awareness. The um, raw material accounts for 50% uh, of major end users' diet, and about 12% uh, environmental impact occurs during production of raw material and manufacturing of products. Uh, sustainability is, is, is not only protecting the environment, but uh, it has a lot to do with uh, ensuring that stakeholders in the value chain are treated in a socially just way and also in a, an economic uh, viable way. And this is very much uh, the case for, for instance, of the um, small holders. Uh, in um, among the sustainability uh, areas that uh, the sector is trying to address, um, we have uh, these four uh, pillars, responsible production and, and, and consumption, improving the small tower livelihood, transparency in supply chain, and certainly the circular economy of which we have uh, spoken not much during uh, these two days, but certainly we, it will be addressed <coughs> today by other, by other speakers. Uh, in terms of uh, sustainability, there is, there is uh, an, on, an ongoing industry partnership to address uh, these challenges to other stock, stockholders and broadening the sustainability agenda. And we have uh, had um, also announcement of sustainability policy by some major uh, organization in the sector. Uh, ISG certainly has its own uh, also sustainability agenda and um, is based on uh, the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and uh, through this agenda, now we are trying to uh, concentrate <clears throat> on very important topics uh, that uh, might um, affect uh, the natural rubber sector, uh, and among which, of course, uh, climate change is one of the, of the most important, and this is the reason why you know, we have called for the, for the organization of this, uh, of this workshop. Acknowledging that there is a lot of knowledge <clears throat> in the sector, but you know, that we have to make an effort to uh, put this in a, a framework uh, that uh, could be beneficial for <clears throat> the all uh, natural lab stakeholders. Um, we collaborate, of course, with the other organization. Collaboration is uh, for us a very important pillar. So these are some of the organizations with whom we uh, work together on, uh, on these topics. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I wanted to give you a few um, ideas on what, on how we think the climate change uh, topic in a sustainability framework for natural rubber should be, uh, in a way, addressed. Uh, we, have, we know that the Earth climate is changing. Uh, this change will bring uh, acute hazards such as it waves and floods to grow in frequency and severity, and the chronic hazards such as drought and rising sea levels to intensify in the future. Uh, and this physical risk uh, will translate into increased socioeconomic risk, presenting policymakers and business leaders with a number of questions that will challenge existing assumption about supply chain robustness and the resilience risk models and more. Uh, for centuries, financial markets, companies, even governments uh, no, have based their own decision on uh, a climate that was relatively stable. But the coming fiscal climate risk is uh, now ever-changing and non-stationary. So replacing a stable environment with, with one of constant change means that the decision making based on experience alone may prove unreliable. Also, we have heard that the climate hazard manifests locally. So there are significant variations uh, also for natural rubber between countries and even within countries. 
uh, the different effects of physical climate risk must be understood in the context of a geographically defined area. Climate change can have also knock-on effects across regions and sectors uh, through interconnected socioeconomic and financial systems. So supply chains are particularly vulnerable systems since they price efficiency over resilience or robustness. They might quickly glean to a halt if critical production hubs are affected by intensifying hazards. And also we know that the purest communities and population of the world are the most vulnerable. So what, these, what are the implications for NATO Araba? So business as usual is not an option. As this workshop has shown, uh, further researchers are needed to investigate the real risk posed by climate change to the NATO, to the NATO Arab systems. We need data and information, and science has to play a fundamental role. We need a very uh, research and development leadership with focus on emerging mass markets and invest to realize future potential technology. There is a wide range, uh, wide gap between the knowledge available in the institutional framework and the knowledge convert, converted to effective practice. So we need to improve and make effective the knowledge transfer process. The research and development programs has to be based on public-private partnership at the national and international level. Now we need to bring uh, uh, innovations and we need to review the pool of resources available and target effective results. Innovative form of collaboration across national borders are very important. And I think this workshop shows that it's very important to find um, a way to collaborate between governments, business, academia, and civil society. Now we cannot uh, face uh, these issues uh, alone and uh, we need to uh, bring together uh, our knowledge, our information, and try to identify what uh, to do next. And most important, we have to act now. Climate change requires urgent, coordinated, and consistent action. We cannot further delay uh, in um, big discussions. We can find, uh, we have to identify an action plan that uh, address uh, all these issues for the benefit of uh, our generations, but also for the future generations. Thank you very much. In the, okay, can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think thank you for the uh, representing the rubber picture. So I've given you a bit of extra time there to complete your story. So now we go next to the second speaker, Christopher Matthias from C4, uh, he's, yes. he's going to speak about the, the title is Towards Circular Bioeconomy, a research initiative. So, okay, please, 10 minutes for you. Okay, let me just share this, which is now not working. Uh, share screen. Okay, here we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can, clear. Yeah, do you hear my voice well enough? Oh, so very clear. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> First of all, ap apologies for holding up the meeting in the beginning. I, I was going on my bike to, to the office and my bike broke down, so I had to come back home. It was not the rubber tire <laughs> that broke, it was the chain. Okay. So it's good that we have virtual conferences, but we still interact with the real world sometimes, which is good. Um, so um, you heard it from Salvatore, business as usual is not an option. So the question is, what is then the alternative? And my presentation uh, is about, has the sort of provocative title, do donuts grow on trees? You may answer that they don't grow on rubber trees. But uh, this is basically not about the donut as, as a product, but the donut as an economic model. 
and I'm coming, going to come back to that. Um, the question is how to de deliver a circular bioeconomy for low emissions development involving forests and trees. That's uh, the new we are designing at C4 and ECRAF um, for to, to, you know, a long term program that we want to initiate. And it basically goes to, to respond to the emissions gap, which means we have emissions. We have a goal of 1.5 or 2 degrees, and, and we are not currently getting there because we are still emitting too much, and our efforts to, to cut emissions are too slow. And so um, what can we do in, in the economic world on this, in the production world? Um, one answer is always voluntary lifestyle changes. You see one of the graphs that you can find in the internet. You know, you can stop traveling around on a plane, you can stop traveling around in a car, you can do a lot of things, you can even have fewer child because every person on the planet has emissions, but uh, it gets sometimes a bit weird with that letter. So basically what we see is that consumer uh, responses uh, are forced in the, in the developed world, but in the developing world, they're still not very strong sometimes. And so the voluntary lifestyle changes are certainly an element, but they're not going to solve the problem. Um, we, I think we need to discuss also what we produce and for what we produce it. This is an example uh, by Alexander Müller, who is a ECRAF board, board a member and uh, he, gave a, he gave that presentation in a workshop in Bonn in 2017. Looking at the corn production in the US, you would say maize, corn, that is a, a food security, that is food, so it's about food security. But if you look at what the corn goes into, it goes into corn syrup to 49%. That goes into soft drinks and that makes people unhealthy. So is that the right production we need? Is that the, the, the production we want to use the land for? So these are the questions we want to answer in this, uh, in this project. Um, if food waste, you know, one third of all food is that is produced globally is ending up as waste on the, in the transport, not being sold over the counter, uh, being thrown out of the fridge because the date is over and so on. If food waste was a country, it would be the third largest country in the world. So that's another aspect that we, that we try to address. Certainly not relevant so much for rubber, but relevant globally. And then you have these, uh, these attempts at developing green new deals. You have now, I, I took these examples from, from the US and from uh, Rifkin, which is, a, which is a book on the topic. Uh, but basically now you have also the EU Green Deal uh, policy. And basically what all these uh, approaches do is they join emissions, gas reductions, but also look at justice and equity and a, a, a fair transition uh, to a new economy. And that's again what Salvatore said, you cannot forget the stakeholders along the uh, value chains, uh, along the production lines, you want to give them equal conditions, you want to treat them, treat them fairly. So these, uh, these aspects are important. And then finally, getting to the donut, uh, you all may have seen the planetary boundaries uh, graphs uh, like 10 years ago uh, on the outer circle in this, uh, around this green donut here you see planetary boundaries. Yeah. We, are, we are losing you. So Matthias, we, we cannot hear oh. you. Can you hear me better now? Is What's it working? Oh. What can I do? Is it better now? It's working fine from my end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me hmm? let me go on. Um, let me know if if it if it doesn't work. So we have the, the donut economy, which basically links the planetary boundaries to what people need. So what people need is on the inside, uh, water, food, health, and so on. And what the planet needs is on the outside. And we need to somehow balance these two needs. That's the message of the donut economics. Um, right, yeah. 
So we're looking at a few, th a few new, new things in the, in the wood and forest industry. And we see a lot of technical innovations coming up, new building technologies, hardening, stabilizing wood into, for example, imp imperme impermeabilization. So you can build bathtubs and such. You can make it softer, you can make it, make it harder, you can add transparency, and you can add new qualities like energy storage. Um, you can even build on reflective qualities of wood to reflect some of the global warming back into the atmosphere. And that is one of the prototypes of this wood that is treated in a way that it reflects uh, 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 radiation back into the atmosphere in a bandwidth that the atmosphere lets pass. And um, so, and you, you can build houses, you can build buildings, so 10 story buildings out of, totally out of wood or with a mix of wood and cement are uh, already being built everywhere uh, and bigger houses are, are uh, in the pathway. So what does it mean? Actually, every person on the planet uses, on average, and just based on statistics, half cubic meter of wood. So can we the need? Can we reproduce the, the rubber we need? We, we just saw in the previous presentation that large areas in Asia are producing rubber. So if there are new wood products coming up in the in a bioeconomy, do we actually have the area to produce this? And that's the, that's again another question we want to address. We think we can um, achieve emission reductions. This is a quick back of the envelope calculation. So the emissions uh, from agriculture overall are 13 gigatons per year. And we think that with a combination of value chain uh, interventions, new thinking about what needs to be produced, where, and, um, and new technologies, we could get close to uh, reduce those emissions from from that side here, and so the the delivering the, the the circular bioeconomy for low emissions development is basically going into three directions. First is going green, developing new biomaterials, and that's my question actually. What can rubber production and what can rubber? How can rubber be part of this? And then choosing goals. If we so global societal debates about what needs to be produced, where, how. How sustainably? Uh, if if we see demand going down for rubber, for natural rubber, and and also for syn synthetic rubber, then what does it mean? Is this a byproduct that is that is on the on the extinction, or you know, is is this something that is not well uh, uh, steered? And and we need to weave it together, as I call it, um, bringing in value chains into more sustainable and more connected value webs. And we want to do this in a peri-urban context because we see that many of these problems are exacerbated in peri-urban areas around large cities in developing countries. And we see there is a huge dynamic there and we want to, to uh, use that dynamic to develop some of these ideas. We are doing already something along those lines in FTA, in the Forestries and Agroforestry Program on bamboo value chains, on bioenergy, on furniture value chains, on nutrition, restoration, and so on. But there is much more, and we want to bring this together into a coherent proposal. And so the question then in this context here is where and how does rubber come in? I have a few ideas, sustainable bioproduction, improved value chains, and so on. Um, if you have ideas, I don't think we have time for discussion, but maybe later, but otherwise, please write me. Thank you very much. This is, these are the picture sources. Yeah, thank you. Okay, is my presentation on full screen, Fabio? Yes, it is. It is. Great, okay. So I'm uh, Michael Brady, I'm a uh, scientist with C4 and I lead our program on value chains, finance and investment. And I'm gonna talk to you today about a uh, relatively new initiative on sustainable wood for a sustainable world and its relevance to the uh, rubber and climate change agenda uh, for this week's webinar. The Sustainable Wood for a Sustainable World or SW4SW is it's an initiative that's come out of the collaborative partnership on forests. And this is uh, a number of partners 
mainly FAO, uh, WWF, C4, World Bank, ITTO, and uh, more recently, uh, CITES. The initiative has a, a number of objectives, uh, primarily to raise awareness of the availability of sustainable wood products and their wide uses and benefits. So this links to uh, some of the comments we heard just now from Christopher on, on the use of rubber wood. Um, and in particular, uh, or, or another key objective related to rubber wood is uh, showing how, where, and when wood contributes to a sustainable bioeconomy. And uh, the initiative operates at a number of levels. Uh, we're trying to influence policy, uh, operations at, at, the, at the forestry level, uh, political levels, uh, advocating for wide reaching benefits of wood, and at the scientific level with a, a number of our uh, members being scientific organizations and providing the evidence for uh, sustainable wood production and use. Well, I think we've, we've all seen this diagram a number of times this week. Clearly, uh, rubber uh, area, harvested area is increasing, uh, and, and certainly projections go further, further increases. So rubber, latex, and wood, uh, we, we see a, a, an increased production and, and volume. So there's a real opportunity to strengthen rubber within the uh, Sustainable Wood for Sustainable World program, uh, both from its um, aspects of latex, uh, that we talked about this week, and uh, more uh, today's discussion on, on the use of rubber wood. Uh, as, as Chris mentioned, uh, forests are now, we're really now viewing forests as part of a bioeconomy where all biological resources are, are being used from forests, and more specifically, a, a wood-based bioeconomy concept that's, that's now starting to emerge, uh, where all biological resources to derive from wood, including latex, um, uh, are, are being looked at for wider uses. Um, I've been involved in a number of rubber wood um, projects around the world. You can see in, in the photos, uh, typically where rubber plantations uh, become uh, over mature. In this case, uh, a 50 year old, uh, well over mature plantation in, in Java, where they're now tapping up into the tree branches. Um, and that's, that's a, an example of uh, over mature wood ready for, for renovation. Um, more and more we're seeing that wood being used um, for a number of um, products, uh, different furniture products, panel products. Um, we're seeing um, wood, rubber wood now being used for bioenergy. Um, typically in, in the past rubber wood was, was often uh, had very, very low value and was used for brick make, you know, kiln, firing kilns for bricks and tiles. But we're seeing now prices have increased substantially to the point where I, I believe in Malaysia, uh, the export of rubber wood is limited because of, uh, of high uh, domestic demand. So more and more we're seeing uh, rubber wood increase in value. It does have some limitations, its properties. Um, it's quite susceptible to um, uh, fungal infection, uh, blue stain, um, to the point where it, it must be uh, harvested and transported almost immediately, which, which adds uh, substantial costs to, particularly to smallholders. But it, it, uh, it has a nice, even grain and it holds uh, finish quite well. So it does have some positive properties for, uh, for manufactured goods. 
uh, overall, I think building on what Chris has mentioned, um, uh, concepts of uh, bioeconomy, uh, we can see the, the role of uh, rubber latex with a much, much broader uh, array of non-wood non forest products. And the uh, Sustainable Wood for Sustainable World initiative is now recognizing these, these non-wood uh, products as, as being valuable in the same way that you know that the wood itself is uh, I guess again following on from Chris's donut diagram um, this is a little bit more specific to uh, non-wood forest products as part of the, uh, the bioeconomy and linking that to uh, sustainable livelihoods uh, environment and social sustainability and developing sustainable governance systems so um, rubber latex fits very well within this concept. And ju just to conclude, um, the Sustainable Wood for Sustainable World uh, initiative is participating in another webinar this week, sponsored by uh, uh, FAO, and with a focus on uh, responses to COVID-19 uh, in the forestry sector. And we're, uh, we're presenting um, quite a, a detailed uh, survey that the Sustainable Wood for Sustainable World initiative has uh, completed on impacts of forest value chains and sector responses. So I uh, encourage you to have a look at the survey results. I've put the web uh, address here and uh, it, it includes uh, rubber wood as well. So with that, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your legality and avoided deforestation. Please, 10 minutes. All right. Yes, I'm going. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so this presentation is uh, is about um, one one tool that has been applied, has been around now for about 15, 20 years, um, and it's targeting the uh, the promotion of, of how you how you trade basically timber uh, in a legal way. I, I will explain the basics of what it is. Um, I'm not an expert in, in rubber, so uh, but bear with me for a, for, a, for a while and then we see whether these schemes is something that could be uh, one of the options for, for, for rubber in the future. Um, sorry, how do I move? Okay. Where is this coming from? This is coming from, from a very high pressure from uh, environmental NGOs. Uh, all over the world in the 90s and um, and basically the topics that were targeted are the same topics that I hear here also uh, for this session but in general for the for this for this meeting um, sustainability uh, the economic uh, social financial sustainability local indigenous people and and the and the the usual suspect topics that uh, uh, us and environmental NGOs used to raise so because of that pressure, the response from uh, one of the major actors uh, in those days was from the European Union. And, um, and this was under, the, uh, under the, the name, the acronym FLEC-T, which is Forest Law Enforcement, Governance and Trade Action Plan. Now I'm seeing uh, several of those same things that I used to say 15, 20 years ago for timber now coming up for rubber especially where, where I work mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll come back to this later. Um, what is FLECT? So basically FLECT is a, what is called, as a, is a very a pragmatic uh, approach to how you tackle timber trade. Uh, I stress the words public policy here because uh, 
it is not considering all the private part of the response, which is a certification, private certification, voluntary, etc., which also exists uh, in, the, in, the, in the case of, of rubber. But, but this is specifically a public, pub, public policy response. And it works very, very schematically here, but very easily. So basically you produce timber in your producer country. Uh, you export that to the European Union. And then in the European Union, either you have a license that is coming from where you are sourcing your timber and you have a green lane and you go to the market, or you don't have that license and then you are uh, to go under scrutiny, um, which is improving, uh, but, but would be very strong scrutiny for due diligence and all type of documentation that you need to place the timber on the European market. The big difference between uh, what you see on the left of the screen, so where you have a bilateral trade agreement, is that because the, the FLEC T work with two major tools. And basically, these are the tools. One is what is called a traceability, it's called, sorry, a timber legality assurance systems, which is in the producing country. So this is a trade agreement in, in very simple words that the European Union, the member states sign with the producing country. They sign a trade agreement and in the trade agreement, there's a lot of things, but basically it says that you as a producer country guarantee that the timber that is coming out of your uh, forest is legal with a lot of, of strings attached. And then in Europe, uh, at the bottom part of the screen, you have the European timber regulation, which means that this is the tool that you will use once the timber arrive in Europe, you will say, do you have the FLEC license coming from the producing country? Yes, okay, you can go. You don't have the FLEC license, then you go a lot of scrutiny and you have to invest as a private producer, you have to invest a lot in your due diligence system. So that's basically the advantage of the incentives on which FLECT is working um, to play with the two tools. One is the VPA, the Voluntary Partnership Agreement, which is a trade agreement, and one is the EUTR, the European Union Timber Regulation. That's, that's the basic in um, and, and the theory. Um, as of now, there are several, about 15 countries that have uh, engaged into this process. And when I say 15 countries, I mean producing countries. So you see them there. They are all across the tropics. Um, some of them have already signed the trade agreement and are implementing. Some of them uh, are in preparing for the signature of the, of the trade agreement. And only one, Indonesia, has signed, implemented, and has arrived to have a fully functional uh, traceability system, timber legality assurance system, as it is called, the SVLK for those that live in Indonesia, and also export with a FLEC license. So uh, since 2016, Indonesia is exporting timber to European Union and all over the place with a FLEC license on it. Um, why I'm, I'm stressing these, these um, checks on the other countries like China, Korea, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and the US. Because all over the years, as the European Union uh, started with this approach, many other countries have also uh, started their own approach. And I've shown, I will show them also here. This is basically what's, what's been the tropical wood product imports by global region in the last 20 years. And, uh, and you see that uh, when FLEC started, in 2004, so around here, Europe was one of the major, was the major importer of tropical timber. As of today, Europe is not anymore in that same position. But what I want to, 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 to show with these uh, names up here in red is that over the years, several other countries, importing mostly, consuming countries of tropical timber, have joined the bandwagon of action taken to um, to be sure that the timber that they use is from legal origin. They do not have the same approach of the European Union, so they do not basically, none of these, go to the producing country and sign a trade agreement with them, but they do have much stronger legal frameworks in their own countries to avoid that timber comes in and, and there's a lot of scrutiny. 
The last one here outside is China. Uh, it's still the, it's the most recent and the most still unclear because there is a lot of need for new regulations, etc., to be written. But the, the forest law that, that was passed last year uh, in China for the first time clearly also indicate that China will not authorize um, illegal timber from, from illegal origin. And so we believe that it will probably, it is also moving along in the way of doing something to avoid that timber uh, that reaches China comes from illegal, illegal sources. Um, so as you see, started from the European Union and other, and then there's a lot of uh, uh, momentum and, and, and basically all the major consumer countries in the world are coming on, uh, on, on board. Uh, I had a look, uh, I, I saw the, the first presentation from, uh, from Salvatore, so that was much uh, more um, uh, relevant, I think. But uh, I see a picture from rubber here and it seems that the number of countries concerned is not very much different from the ones that it's, it's concerned by tropical timber. Probably there's a, 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 big, a, big, a much bigger um, numbers in producing two or three countries and in consuming. I see China there as, as one of the really major, major. So I'm not sure that this option, uh, we all is full-fledged uh, panoply of, 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 of tools. Is, is adapted for wood, but it seems that the picture is, is pretty clear. Uh, it's pretty similar, sorry. Um, and again, uh, one big question that is always out there, are these policy options working? Um, we don't have, it's still too young as a process. 15 years in these things are, are, are not that, that, that long time. But you see, for instance, here, um, major, and, and probably more mature markets in Europe, like the Netherlands here and, and the UK, uh, since when Indonesia started to export uh, with the flat license, um, their import from Indonesia has grown a lot. So there is an indication. I wouldn't say that it's all because Indonesia now is exporting with a flat license, but there are indications that um, countries that are very receptive to legality and sustainability do have a premium, do, do give a premium, place a premium on, on, on exporting countries that can guarantee at least the legality with strings of sustainability, of course, attached to that. Um, and this is the downstream, so the consumer side. On the, on the upstream, so is it also working? The trade agreements, are they also working in the producing side or are they improving uh, sustainable forest management? Are they improving the social conditions? Uh, those are some of the expectations that people that put in place the uh, flag T and other um, legality legal frameworks had in mind. We just conducted a recent analysis in three countries, Ghana, Indonesia, and, and Cameroon. And we found that in some way on some topics, specifically on the forest conditions and some others like in governance, environmental governance, they do have a positive impact. They show positive impacts in the countries that engage into these schemes. So uh, for other topics, for example, in, in, the, frame, in, in the topic of jobs creation uh, and uh, being able to differentiate between uh, informal timber production and formal, it's still uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot still needs to be done, but, but it's already positive that at least in, in some of the, of the thematic areas, it is having an impact. So that said, um, remember this, where it was coming from. I go back to my initial slide. Um, I, I don't know whether this would work. This is probably uh, too much or, or too big an investment for, uh, for rubber. That's for you to tell me. I, I don't know uh, rubber trade at all. But what I, what I can see is that in Central Africa, at least, um, more and more we see companies that are coming and are starting to develop rubber plantation for for the international market. And these rubber plantations are today uh, being allocated also by the government on uh, some of the logging concessions that, that, um, that we had or, or we still have. And, it, and it's always not a very clear environment or how you negotiate a contract, um, who, who grant you the, 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 the authorization, how it is going with the deforestation and plantation. 
So there's a lot of discussions going on in the Congo Basin. And, and, uh, and so I think that e even if PLEC is probably not the tool that can be applied to rubber, uh, certainly something like that is in the making for the future of rubber trade uh, across the world. So some, some responses should, should probably be given um, unless you guys want to go again into what Timber uh, faced in the 90s with the, with the boycotts and, and all, uh, all that we know about that. Uh, and with that, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paolo. I think it's very informative. And we move to the last paper in this session. Amy Duchel. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. So your presentation is entitled Jurisdictional Approaches to Land Use Change and Managing Competition between rubber sector and other users. So 10 minutes, please. So, please, Amy. Thanks so much for having me here today. I'll be talking about jurisdictional approaches to reducing deforestation and promoting sustainable livelihoods in relation to natural rubber production. So what are jurisdictional approaches? Some of us may have heard of them in relation to Red Plus initiatives, others in relation to corporate commitments for zero deforestation supply chains. But in their broadest sense, jurisdictional approaches are government-led, holistic approaches to forest and land use across one or more legally defined territories. So they're really like landscape approaches, but because they're grounded in political territory, they can leverage policy instruments towards sustainability. Since 2017, C4 with Earth Innovation Institute and the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force has undertaken a study of subnational jurisdictional approaches across the tropics. So we looked at 39 states and provinces that had made commitments to reducing deforestation. Those in green are members of the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, and those in blue are other states and provinces that had made similar commitments. And we assessed them on different elements of sustainability. So not only whether they had reduced deforestation relative to a baseline, but also if they had integrated land use planning um, instruments in place, if they had robust monitoring systems, multi-stakeholder processes for decision-making and mechanisms for recognizing local rights. And of all of the jurisdictions in the study, the state of Acre, Brazil came out as most advanced on, on most of the elements. So I thought that I would delve into the story of Acre today, not only because it's an advanced jurisdictional approach, but also because it has a link to, the, to natural rubber production. So Acre is the smallest state in the Brazilian Amazon. It's only 2% of Brazil's territory, but it's still the size of a country like Nepal. It's covered in 87% of primary forest with more than half of the state in protected areas and indigenous lands. And it's really served as a laboratory for different types of forest-based development. So the story of Acre starts with natural rubber production and, you know, rubber tappers across the Brazilian Amazon, um, but also in Acre contributed to Brazil's role as a major rubber exporter 100 years ago in the first rubber boom and then again during World War II. So after the collapse of, of, of that big industry, rubber tappers stayed in the forest, engaging in diverse forest-based livelihoods and managing huge areas of forest. So they kept tapping rubber, but they were also collecting Brazil nuts, hunting and fishing. But in the 1980s, deforestation was on the rise and that was mostly because of cattle ranching. And cattle ranchers in Acre started to invade some of those traditionally held lands by rubber tappers. And Chico Mendes, who's a pretty well-known figure, probably needs no introduction, but he led the rubber tapper movement against deforestation in the 1980s in Acre. And as he says here, at first I thought I was fighting to save rubber trees. Then I thought I was fighting to save the Amazon rainforest. Now I realize I'm fighting for humanity. 
the rubber tappers movement as a social movement was really about land rights and social justice for the most vulnerable. So in 1988, he was gunned down in front of his house in Shakuri Acre by a cattle rancher with whom he had had an ongoing conflict. And that led to an international outcry about the importance of the rubber tappers movement, but also forest based livelihoods in the Amazon more generally. It led to the creation of an innovative policy model of extractive reserves. So this is really a protected area model that started in Acre, but spread across the Brazilian Amazon, where um, conservation and development based on the forest were intertwined. But importantly, you know, things evolve. And as the price of rubber declined and rubber tappers were gleaning less and less income from that product, they also started to, to turn towards cattle raising, even inside the extractive reserves. And this is a really nice illustration from a Brazilian artist who's sort of showing that, you know, cattle serves as a safety net for a lot of rubber tappers, but, you know, without reinforcement of that sector, that cattle could actually walk away and, and take the whole rubber industry with it. So in 1999, Georgi Vianic became the governor of Acre, and he began to construct a series of public policies centered on forest-based development. So really trying different strategies to give value to standing forests. And his government became known as the Governo da Floresta or the forest government. One of the things he did was try to reinvigorate the, the natural production of rubber in extractive reserves. And so he instituted subsidies for rubber production, but also built a condom factory that would source natural rubber to produce latex for condoms. And what's really interesting is that this was kind of a grassroots local initiative, but they made connections to the Brazilian Ministry of Health and actually began to produce condoms for distribution across the country, including um, at the Olympic Games in Rio in 2016. So this all leads to CISA, which is Acre's state system of incentives for environmental services, which was passed into law in 2010 and basically serves as the legal backbone for Acre's jurisdictional approach to reducing deforestation. And it brings in all of that history of forest-based development policy under this legal umbrella. And since 2012, CISA has received funding, substantial funding from Germany and UK's Red Early Movers Program. And it's gained international attention largely because of its unique benefit sharing mechanism, where one third of the revenue generated is directed to forest stewards. So rubber tappers, Brazil nut collectors, indigenous peoples, um, to recognize them for their role in, in helping conserve forests in Acre. CIFOR has been analyzing the impacts of CISA since 2010, and we found clear livelihood benefits for people targeted by the program. So here I am in Acre talking to local farmers, and we interviewed a total of 240 households, first in 2010, again in 2014, and a third time in 2018 to try to assess impacts over time. Importantly, we talked to participants in the CISA program, but we also talked to people who had not yet benefited from the program so that we were able to compare. And our main finding from that work so far is, is that we, we really are seeing statistically significant increases in the income and assets of households participating in CISA. And when you look at the income portfolio um, more closely, we really see that those income increases are coming from more from environmental income, including forest products, as well as wage labor, and a decreased reliance on livestock. So I think we can say that, you know, that's a pretty successful result in terms of CISA promoting sustainable livelihoods. But not everything is good news. Um, as we know, Jair Bolsonaro, the guy in the middle, is president of Brazil, and he's been rolling back on environmental and social regulations in the country. And when he was elected, in fact, there was a wave of, of 
right-wing governors who were elected with him, including a much more conservative governor in Acre, who has a very different vision of development than the former governors um, who were really following Georgie Viana's vision of, of forest-based development. Um, the new governor is much more focused on expansion of cattle ranching and agricultural intensification. Um, that said, he has maintained the CISA program, um, likely because it's part of state law, but also because there's a whole multi-stakeholder process that went into its construction and implementation. And also because he sees um, potential finance for forests on, this, on the horizon. So the governor, the new governor of Acre was one of the supporters of the California Tropical Forest Standard which was endorsed by the California Air Resources Board last year and could eventually be incorporated into their cap and trade program and actually provide finance for um, jurisdictional Red Plus programs like ACRES. So, you know, there is new finance on the horizon and finance for forests and forest based livelihoods is, is certainly needed. I'll leave you with some further reading. So about Acre, about jurisdictional approaches. And I'm not here live to answer questions, but my email is at the bottom of the slide. And if you write to me, I promise to get back to you quickly so that we can continue the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Amy. Uh, now we have come to the end of this session and we will uh, conduct the panel discussion. So anyone, any of the participants would like to comment on any of the four or five presentations uh, this afternoon, you are welcome to do so. Can you please just identify yourself and your organization and we can proceed. We have about 20 minutes for this panel discussion. Okay, anyone to, to start? Uh, Maybe I, I can I can start. I'm Philip Thaler from CIRAD. Sorry. Okay, Philip. Yes, please. Yes. So uh, I'm the representative of CIRAD in uh, GPSNR, and also participating to project, uh, uh, trying to see how rubber, the rubber uh, commodity, can uh, respect the new rules that will be uh, set on for avoiding imported deforestation in France, and that will be the same in other European countries. And uh, the most uh, difficult point was about uh, traceability in rubber, because as you know, rubber is produced by millions of small farmers, and the bigger market is, is for tires. And most of the tire, uh, the rubber that is used in tire comes from mixed source. So it's really difficult so far to have a, uh, the traceability of the product and without traceability of course you cannot uh, demonstrate in any way that your product uh, respect uh, rules whatever the rules they are it can be uh, social rules or uh, environmental uh, uh, impact so traceability is really the, the main issues for every uh, attempt to have rubber product uh, certified or at least uh, to demonstrate the impact on social and environmental uh, issues. Maybe as an immediate reaction, do you have some suggestions to make? You know the situation with smallholders and you say not transparent. Do you have some, you have been involved in this uh, sustainability yes. project. What are your suggestions so we can also discuss that this afternoon? The, yes, the, the suggestion now, the, the advantage is that uh, in uh, GPSNR particularly, all the big uh, tire companies are involved. And they have a real powerful, uh, with a logistic means, and they can, they can, they are developing methods that are based on what have been done on other natural resources, not only uh, uh, agricultural resources, but also like uh, uh, minerals or things like that. And uh, there is a lot of progress that is going to be done on traceability, thanks to combining, I would say. Uh, uh, data management and also the fact that now, even in the most remote areas, most of the farmers, they have a, a, a phone, mobile phone. And through this, we can, we can expect that we will have huge progress in, in traceability. But th that's really the, the, I would say, one of the big uh, uh, 
topic to, to, to be discussed and where, where we can also do research together with this kind, with the, the, the producers and with the end users and with the organization like IRS, IRS sorry, and GPSNL. Uh, any other uh, comment on this, please? Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd like to comment if I can. Uh, it's Michael. Uh, I, I, I certainly agree with, with Philip's comment on traceability being a, a huge challenge, but other commodities have have also addressed traceability and, and are perhaps further advanced than, uh, than rubber latex. I'm thinking in the uh, uh, oil palm sector, even in smallholder uh, forestry, where uh, systems for chain of custody uh, have been developed and are, 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 being, are being used widely. Um, uh, under uh, say RSPO or FSC, uh, PEFC, a number of systems um, have have made advances on traceability. But as as Philip mentions, uh, when you start combining commodities together, uh, I guess for rubber and in the case of combining uh, natural latex with synthetic for uh, for various products. Uh, traceability becomes becomes a challenge, and also the complexity of uh, smallholder you know, layers of um, of agents uh, above smallholders can also provide challenges for tracing back to uh, you know to rubber rubber trees, rubber forests. But uh, but but progress has been made, and and I think GPSNR is looking at some of these other systems for for ideas. Thank you. Any other comments? Anybody from the rubber industry there listening would like to contribute some ideas of how we can overcome this problem? Uh, you see, smallholders, they are, they are distributed far and wide. But, but I think they also understand issues like this, issues we we go to the small holders because this involves extension activities are we still on with it still you can hear me can can you yeah. hear me is it is the audio yeah. okay There are many things, many demands are facing difficulty, especially now. And this, you mentioned the big tire companies, very few of them come forward to say, look, we're helping with the transparency, we demand certain quality things, you respond, and now you are facing difficulty. Because if we talk about sustainability, the way I understand the sustainability issues, three piece, people, so smallholders, very important. Tire companies, also very important. Then planet, and we recognize that they are planting these trees, very important heavier trees. Then profitability, profit, they don't get this. And you know, that we are faced with the issue of them exiting the rubber industry. There are thousands of hectares of rubber, small holdings, not being tapped because it's not worthwhile. They have to get up and tap and collect the rubber and sell it to the processors. So how can we also put these issues together, sustainability in a proper context? And they are, they are, they are also asking, you are putting a lot of these things, sustainability issues on natural rubber. You are quiet about synthetic rubber. And we know that many of the Thai companies own synthetic rubber plants. And some of these are polluting. So how can we balance this so that smallholders feel very happy? You care about them. You're also looking at the, you say not transparent. Obviously, it's not transparent. Millions of small holders, 13 million in the world. So can you respond to that? Or not? This is a concern that we face when we talk about the small holders. Price of tires go down. The price of tires always go up. But the rubber for the last many years has been downhill. So how do we explain this to them when we want to get their cooperation 
on transparency, everything. Any one of you, I mean, those who are involved in the, because I've raised this issues many times. We have problem. Uh, can I comment on, on that? Please, please. Yeah, I, I think the presentation that Amy uh, gave on jurisdictional approaches is one area that um, ha shows some real promise in that it, um, you know, for sustainability um, concerns, it takes the pressure off of individual uh, smallholders or uh, operations uh, who need to pay for certification services uh, and brings that up to the jurisdictional level. Um, so that, I, I think that's a, an area that, that is being explored um, and, and shows some real promise to, you know, focus on a, a jurisdictional, um, um, uh, jurisdictional area or approach where that brings in local regulations, local, um, you know, local government involvement, um, again, to, to try and address the problem, but from a different angle uh, and taking pressure off individual smallholders from uh, you know, struggling to pay for, pay for uh, audits and things like that, which you know, is shown to be very, very difficult. Thanks. Any, any other comments? Uh, you know, I'm very happy to see the presentation by the recording by Emmy. We are quite familiar with Acre. We have gone there to collect materials. And you are also aware, I think, in Mato Grosso, how serious the problem is. But it's slightly different situation when you compare Acre, Mato Grosso, or the other parts of Brazil, where the rubber is harvested from the native rubber trees by the natives. When you go to Southeast Asia everywhere, they own the land. They are making an investment for the rubber industry. And it's been cultivated for the last 130 years, three or four times replanting cycles. So the pressure, suddenly they realize it's becoming more difficult. And from the research point of view, in terms of quality, in 1965, I think Malaysia introduced standard Malaysian rubber. It's no more visual. But other factors, how to make it more transparent, then you have to come and work with the, the, the government because governments of the NR producing countries, they invest billions, billions to improve the productivity. They produce new materials for breeding. Most of these NR producing countries, they have research institutes and the government are pumping millions or billions you know, just to help the smallholders. Then what we are saying, the way, the way I look at it, I think I speak also for the other NR producing countries, there are many things, and who is making the quite happy with? Who does the certification? Then you work through the tire companies, they will certify. Just because 70% natural rubber goes to the tire companies. And now when we are talking about conservation, we are going to Peru to collect materials. We will be happy through the, your group, the GPSNR, communicate with the tire companies, help to sponsor some of these things. This is conservation in also helping the Brazilians because we will give the materials improve in, in the different countries to them. So my concern is we have talked to the smallholders, we see they are responding, but the issue is never ending and the price is going down. So this is the issue now, economic issue, the title of this afternoon, which I think is very appropriate, sustainability policies, including economic and social dimensions. So the social dimensions is forgotten most of the time. So that's, that's how I, I need to respond. I think I'm also responding on behalf of the, of the yeah, NR producing countries. Because for World Business Council, where is the voice of the smallholders? We should be talking to the smallholders and see how they can work together with you. And I'm sure the governments of the NR producing countries are always happy to cooperate. But please don't apply too much pressure, especially now, when it's not worthwhile even to go and tap the rubber. So these are social dimensions you should be aware of. You talk to the Indonesian, see what's the situation now. And where, where, is, where are the tire companies to come and say yes? 
sustainable and our production, we are with you. So this, I'm just responding since the others are not. Is there anybody else who wants to respond and maybe give a feedback on this? Uh, just, uh, I, th I think Eric mentioned GPSNR. Um, uh, one of the mandates of GPSNR is to give uh, smallholder uh, rubber farmers a voice, you know, uh, internationally. And, and, and this is a very positive uh, effort to, to try and uh, identify uh, smallholder representatives uh, among rubber producing countries that can engage at that, that international level and you know, convey their, their concerns about sustainable natural rubber. So that uh, there's a number of, of people that are involved in a working group on smallholders. Um, and and I, I believe some good progress is being made. That is, uh, you know, my immediate reaction to that. that. That is positive. If you talk to the smallholders, in Malaysia, we have the Smallholders Association quite a powerful group. And I'm sure if the other countries, you invite them, talk to them, listen, but the always the question is, the price doesn't seem to improve. It is very important. You know, they are not planting rubber as a hobby. They are planting it for livelihood. And I, I remember occasions where we went to some countries, then people on biodiversity, they say, your, your jungle forest rubber is very good. Promotes biodiversity. Then they take a photo of the small farmers. And the children are barefooted, no shoes. This is, if you are looking at synthetic rubber, and what, what is the sustainability issues there? They are asking, so must be a balance. Natural rubber, synthetic rubber. That's why it was agreed in the RSD, but we never see the sustainability criteria for synthetic rubber. Because you protect your interests, you apply pressure on on the smallholders, which I think which is not very fair. That's how I look at it. And I've been very vocal on these issues wherever we meet. And, and the other thing is of advanced planting, good planting material. The That's why are doing. there is no attempt to do there is no attempt to do a certification so far through either GPSNR or RSE, I think, because one of the reasons is that the, the cost would be too high uh, for the small orders and it's too difficult. And also because uh, you know, rubber is not the product that is directly linked to the customers. So it's interesting then to have a label when you have a customer interest of buying directly like a coffee certified or cocoa, everything like this. But very few customers buy directly their tires. And when you buy a tire you're, or when you buy a car, you're not uh, thinking at tires as the main uh, uh, impact for environment, of course. So there is no interest, uh, strong interest, I would say, at developing labels and certification. So that's not, I think, the way uh, either IRSG or GPSNR are, are trying to go forward. So after this, when you have said that, and you talk to other people, like the, the governmental agencies, they say, okay, so how, how are you do, going to demonstrate that you have a positive impact, and that's, that's what you are you are talking about. And it's true that in GPSNR at the beginning, they were mostly, uh, I would say, focusing on reducing the negative impact when they were talking about sustainability. But I think through the discussion that we have with them, well, with them, I think I, I mean in the group, we they are now much more aware that uh, sustainability issue, the, the main sustainability issue for rubber would be that there will be still tappers and people to produce the, 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 the product. So I think we have made them aware that there is a real issue at having uh, systems that would uh, make this product still interesting for the people who are producing it. But how we are going to go forward from this, I think there are still a lot of discussion to, to, to be done. And as you said, also a weakness I see in the GPSNR is that government, government agencies, they are not represented so far. So that's why it's, it would be really relevant to have a discussion through IRC because IRC represent uh, uh, governments and GPSNR. Can I add a comment myself? Please, please, please. <laughs> 
Okay, I think now the, the, the first problem uh, that has been uh, brought forward from uh, Philippe on uh, traceability, I think that is very difficult one and uh, most likely um, it would be addressed or should be addressed on country by country basis because we don't have the same structure of small holders in every country as you know. So I think you know, that is something that um, it has to be looked at very carefully and uh, I don't think could be done a very general um, I mean, discussion or assessment on this. Secondly, now the sector from a social point of view uh, have very few data. I mean, really, the, we have a big gap in terms of data when it comes to social issue. Now, so in some countries, we know who are the small holders, for instance. I mean, for Malaysia has a very structured uh, organization, but in many other countries, we don't know. Now, we don't know um, how these small holders are formed, if how many families, how many men, how many children, how many women are there. So we really don't have a clear picture of what uh, is the situation. And we tried to make a study on that, asking to governments information and figures, but the reality is that there is not much available, except in a few countries. Secondly, as, uh, also, as I said, no, it is, no, we have to go out from this um, situation where we have producers and consumers, uh, each other fighting and uh, uh, bringing things on their own side. I mean, we, of course, interests are different, but I think it's in the interest of everyone, producers and consumers alike, to find a way to make the wrapper sector in general, natural rubber and synthetic rubber uh, sustainable or more sustainable. So really doesn't help uh, you know, this kind of uh, dialogue, um, uh, GPS, NAR, SG and RPC. I mean, we are all in the same uh, situation, in the same boat. We are trying to work together you know, to figure out what the best solutions. And this is what we have to be concentrated on. Now, if we really continue uh, no, this harsh dialogue, we will, know, we will not go anywhere. So I think, I think you know, we have really to make an effort. And this workshop uh, is the demonstration that it's possible. So uh, I invite everyone uh, to, I mean, to be more focused on what are the solutions that we have to look at to improve the sustainability in the rubber sector. Thank you. Thank you, Silvatore. I think just to very quick respond, that's the reason why there's been very active discussion in the RSG. We discuss this uh, and our producing countries who are members, they are there. We have been discussing these issues, but after a while then this goes out of the RSG. Then you have a global forum, and then uh, it's, it's getting to be, you know, no more in that cooperative spirit. So what we are saying, we should sit together, discuss, and I'm sure the small holders will be very happy to do whatever, and at the end of the day, if the price improves, you get your result. But asking small holders to fill forms and all those things, as we discussed in the RSG, there's no go. Small holders don't have the time to go and fill the forms. You remember when we started this? It was I, a problem. Uh, to get. I never saw a discussion in LSG asking small holders to fill to fill form. Eh? No, <laughs> one of the approaches. I mean, uh, one. We, really, no. We have to focus on the solutions. That's it. No, we cannot mm. continue like this. No, we have to focus on the solutions together. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, we maybe we can hear from the others, and are because the panel is supposed to get views, views from the, yeah. the uh, natural rubber producing. Entities, you know. Whoever, any, anyone? Dr. Aziz, may I please ask a question and try to? We we've discussed a lot about traceability to show sustainability, but we yes. are forgetting that by definition, natural rubber is sustainable because renewable. I mean, keeping in mind the presentation this morning about sustainable wood for a sustainable world, natural rubber 
is a sustainable product for a sustainable world. And, and so my question would be more for, for Christopher Marcius, because we, we are focusing on what is the market now, and tire is a very big part of it. But when you think about all the reflection going on on how do we replace plastic, and this is a major environmental issue, much broader than climate and everything, how many natural products do we have that have as many properties as latex to be able to replace some of the growing uses of plastic. And I'm thinking, for instance, about all the, the uses of plastic around food and latex. There are plenty of properties of that. So there may be, no, not there may be, there are certainly huge future markets which will totally change the question of price and, and the relations with the, with the big buyers. Also because for some of these markets with value added and price, the very fact that natural rubber is produced by smallholders will be one more reason for the consumer to be ready to pay a higher price if they have the guarantee that part of this price is going in the pocket of the smallholder. So I'm really, this more addressed to, to Christopher Marxist. What kind of opportunities do you see for new markets for natural rubber in 10 years maybe? But when you're a smallholder, when you plant a tree, you, you also think medium and long term. Uh, thanks, Alexander, for, for, for this question. Uh, There's actually an interesting do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's actually an interesting side discussion some of us in CIFA are having on email right now related to this because, and, and I, but I put some of, it in, of this in the chat and my question to Salvatore, because Salvatore showed this recent drastic drop in demand, both for synthetic but also for natural rubber. And um, I was a bit surprised by that, particularly if, if some articles like the one in, in Nature, which I also shared the link to, say there is an expansion of rubber in, in Asia. So what, why is there an expansion if there is a demand fall? Um, and why is the demand falling if, if the world, I mean, we can imagine why the demand is falling, but uh, this is, as, as Vincent, as, as Alexander says, is, is a natural product and that should be going up. And, and um, I'm not aware of, I'm not, a, I'm not a rubber specialist, so I'm not aware of any uh, latex uses uh, going into plastic substitution or so. That could be an interesting question. Um, I know that some plastic uh, substitution comes from maize and, uh, and other products, so uh, there is clearly a, a bio source for, for plastic substitution, whether it, it could be rubber or not, perhaps. Uh, I think that's something to explore. But I think these things, I mean, these things should become part of a future and, and they must become part of a future bioeconomy. We, we need to get rid of plastic. It's, it's, not, just, it's, it's not just a fossil fuel uh, question, it's, it's a huge pollution problem. I mean, we, we have more plastic now in the ocean than fish. <laughs> everybody, I, I, I recently read a, read a number that everybody in, ingests the amount of plastic in a week that is in a, in a credit card. So it's a lot of plastic going into your body and um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing this any longer. And so I think that's a good suggestion. Uh, Christopher, just, just uh, a reply to you. So, I, mean, I think the demand is slowing down in growth, you know? but the reason is very, uh, I think it's very simple. And this linked to two factors. First, that 70% of natural rubber is going to one sector, that is the automotive sector. So whenever the automotive sector is affected by a crisis or something happening there, you no know, uh, rubber you now feel the pain. Secondly, uh, the biggest market so far and is China. So if China slows down for whatever reason, because they want to increase uh, their own private consumption and uh, um, no, put, uh, put down uh, on investments on where rubber could be used. 
Well, this is uh, still another another um, another issue. So I think uh, Alexander was um, touching a very important point. In natural rubber, we have to find a way to diversify the demand. I mean, we need I mean, not the demand, uh, no rubber or rubber. No, we have to find a way to uh, substitute other materials with rubber. And this, of course, takes time. It takes maybe a life cycle approach. Uh, it takes someone that uh, take the lead on this, now, especially in industry, for instance. But I, we, we need to do this because in other commodities, this is happening because they, are, they have the same issue. Now we have to make the cake bigger. Otherwise, we are always uh, <laughs> basically you know, hitting the same, the same cake. And, uh, and nothing really happening from this side. So, uh, so this is uh, these are the reasons. Uh, yeah, that's that's. Good. I, I'd like to comment. Please, please, yeah. please do. Yeah, just, just I, I'm not uh, I'm not really familiar with the you know alternative uses of latex, but certainly in the wood industry in general, there there really is a, a burgeoning. Uh, emergence of new uh, products derived from wood, cellulose, lignin, um, you know, all of the, the components within wood. Uh, Chris, Christopher showed pictures of new uh, high-rise buildings being, being made from uh, glue laminated wood. Um, we're seeing composite plastics uh, for car, car parts. With, uh, with, with wood fiber. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of examples of uh, biomaterials being developed. It, it's, it's, I, you know, I think it's still at early stages, but there's some really exciting developments. And I, I hope that uh, latex will be included uh, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe any, any question, anybody else would like to pose a question before? The chairman takes the opportunity. Can I, can I make a comment? Yes, wrap up this session. Anybody else? Can I oh, make yes, a comment? Please. Please, yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, especially that we may need to think about the sustainability at the growers level. Because especially ultimately the price is the main factor. But the issue is the who is going to pay the higher price. Because especially when you talk to the manufacturers, they are talking that mean they are in the competition in the international market. Therefore, they have to, whatever the country, they make the rubber products. Still, they have to, in the international market, they have to compete to sell their products. Therefore, they are not in a position to increase any rubber price. That's true, again. That means partly that because they have to keep their profit margin. But we thought, to, especially in the rubber research to Sri Lanka, we discussed about that. And ultimately, because some people in the other industries also cannot pay the uh, rubber farmers. They are obviously ultimately the ultimate beneficiary should pay the uh, real amount, but due for the rubber growers. And the, that's the, uh, that means consumers, consumers of rubber products. If there is some possibility, if the IRSG and the NRPC can join together and make uh, the, some sort of uh, rubber grower sustainable levy, like that's a price variable levy, that means we impose at the consumer level, the small margin. For example, uh, if you take a tire, it weighs about Say a passenger tire, maybe for example, it may weigh about 10 kilos, 10 kilograms. Then the natural rubber component in it, because the, it's having a both synthetic and natural rubber blends, on average, I, I would say about three kilos of natural rubber. Say if we impose a just $0.5 for a natural rubber com com uh, component in the tire, ultimately it costs only 1.5 at $1.5 to the end product the tire. Because especially when you are buying a tire for a consumer, it is not a big issue. If I think all the NRPG and the IRG can jointly make a, that sort of levy to imp uh, can impose at the consumer level, that would be a great, I think, achievement at this system. Of, of course, that we have to think about the expanding the market in the rubber or the latex or other fiber products or whatever. But for the time being, because until we develop the market in such a way, until we develop that, 
uh, I think it would be better to uh, make a desktop of Livy because especially that could be variable because for a, example, if you keep the rubber price as $2, at that time, maybe the $0.5 may be sufficient. But if the rubber price is higher due to the competition, then we can reduce the, that Livy because uh, ultimately then in that case, there won't be an issue to the rubber product manufacturer. At the same time, it will protect the rubber grower. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other any other question? Very quick one before we sorry. wrap up. This. Yeah, please, please do. Who is yeah. there? Yeah, no, sorry, it's uh, Fabio here from the tech yeah, side. Fabio, so, please, please. Uh, just to say that uh, this discussion is really interesting, but we need to move on to session four. So, so if uh, other panelists want to keep on discussing these topics, we can shift this discussion to session uh, to the end of session five. So uh, okay. now we need to wrap up. So Dr. Ziz, please wrap up. Yeah, and, thank uh, you very much. Report. Yep, just one last I thing. I will wrap up. Now. Yes, the one yeah, last okay. thing. All the panelists, uh, uh, we will have a break after the wrap up from Dr. Aziz, but uh, you can answer the uh, questions that are in the chat box and that are in the question and answer panel uh, during the break if you want by typing. So How many minutes break, please, before we close? How many uh, minutes? I think we can have a 10 minute break. Yeah, thank you. It's okay. Okay. Right. Okay, thank Thanks. you. I'll just close this. Uh, first, uh, I would like to just say this. Uh, it, is, it is very important to recognize that the latex goes into the more than 50,000 products, so many products. And we talk about the wood. Certainly, this is one area which is very, very important. It's sustainable, it's green. And talking about looking at, uh, you know, we have, from the research point of view, we have even produced thermoplastic natural rubber. And I think yesterday there was a presentation on new rubbers. Because when you modify the rubbers, you widen the applications. But the problem is the uptake. Because the price is higher than the normal rubber, or even though the properties are much better. I'm talking about the, the, the deprotonized and also the epoxidized natural rubber. But uh, obviously, at the end of the day, this material is important, an industrial raw material, important also to the consumers. So obviously, we need to sit down. But one area which I need to just mention just for information of those from not from the rubber side, all I can say all the rubber research institutes in the world belonging to the natural rubber producing countries, they are not very strong in product development. So we have agreed they should explore, they should make the, the institutes open for young people to come and explore and make some products to, to actually widen the applications. So I would like to thank to take this opportunity now to thank all the speakers and all of you who have participated in the panel discussion, and we have a chance to wrap up towards the end of the day. So thank you very much to all of you for the, for the uh, excellent presentation and also for the slightly heated discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>